Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal, the Continuing Church of God. Are the British descended people the people of the covenant? If so, what covenant? Well, Britain is not great in the sense it was before. Uh, are there any promises in the Bible that uh, refer to the British descended peoples? Do they have any applicability today? Does it have anything to do with the Bible? Does it anything to do with Jesus Christ? Well, those are some of the subjects I want to uh, cover. And I also want to cover what happened to peoples, not just in uh, the British Isles, but also uh, those in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and even a little bit about those uh, in the United States. Now, if you've got your Bibles, uh, you might want to follow along. I'm going to go to the book of Genesis, chapter 48. In Genesis, chapter 48, uh, we have the situation where Jacob, also known as Israel, is about to die. And Joseph, one of his sons, wants to have blessings given upon his own sons. So if you take your Bibles, Genesis chapter 48, starting in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon his bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me in Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I'll make you fruitful and multiply you, and make you a multitude of people, and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Even as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Now Reuben and Simeon were two other uh, children of Israel. So basically what's going on in this process is that Jacob, also known as Israel, told Joseph, his son, that he was going to adopt his grandsons to be considered as his own sons. Now we're going to go further and uh, down to verse uh, 8. Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, These are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, bring them to me, and I will bless them. So there's some type of a covenant blessing going on here. It says, now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near, and he kissed them, and he embraced them. And then he said to Joseph, look, I didn't plan on seeing your, you. Now I get to see your children. This is great. Uh, verse 13, Joseph brought both of them, Ephraim with his right hand toward his dad's left, or Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and he brought him to him. Then Israel stretched out his hand, right hand, and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was younger, and then the left hand put it on Manasseh's head. So he intentionally shifted his arms, even though Manasseh was physically the uh, firstborn. And he blessed Joseph, and go down to verse 16, says, Bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them. Though so his name was Jacob or Israel. So notice he said, Let my name be named upon them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So there's a couple different things going on here. If you continue through Genesis 48, you're going to find out Joseph was not happy that uh, Israel switched hands. And... Uh, uh, his father says in verse 19, Yeah, I know this. He's going to be a people, and he'll be great. So Manasseh is going to be great. But truly, his younger brother will be greater, and his descendants will become a multitude of nations. Not just one nation, but a multitude of nations. So that's one of the things that we see here. The other thing is, you notice it said, Let his name be named on him, as well as Abraham and Isaac. Well, if you think of the term Saxon, in terms of Anglo-Saxon, that actually means Saxon, Isaac's sons. So we have a situation where uh, the, if you look in history, you'll see Saxons sometimes referring to the, uh, the British descended peoples. Uh, you'll also, in the Bible, see the term Israel used prophetically sometimes. In some of those times, it, well, often it's used prophetically, but anyway, some of those times it's actually referring to the descendants of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. So we see that particular covenant at that, at that time. 
And so prophetically, understanding who the children of Israel are, and the sons of Israel and these blessings, gives us an idea of how to understand end time prophecy. Now, when people go through the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, they'll read some things about blessings and cursings and things for Israel and all that and whatnot, and they think this only applies to the Jews. But as it said in Genesis 48, Israel's name was supposed to be named upon uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. And the descendants of Ephraim, we believe, uh, are the British descended peoples of the United Kingdom, uh, including Scotland, Wales, uh, as well as uh, though in, in Northern Ireland, as well as those in uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and parts of South Africa, and some other parts of the, of the world. Now, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, there's various blessings and cursings that are mentioned. I'd like to read something from verse 44 of, of Leviticus 26. It says, Yet for all that, this is talking about the blessings and the cursings, when they're in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor abhor them, to utterly destroy them, and break my covenant with them. So there's some type of covenant with the children of Israel. I am the Lord their God, but for their sake I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations. I am the Lord God. So we see uh, this term covenant used a couple of times here. And the word that's often translated as covenant in the Old Testament is the word uh, brith. And I'm going to explain that word again in a moment. And interesting, the word ish, as in British, is a word, uh, a Hebrew word, uh, that means men or mankind. Uh, you can see that in uh, Isaiah 46, verse 8. And for those of you who have a Strong's concordance, it's Strong's word 377 is this word ish. And it's interesting then that the term uh, British sounds a lot like the Hebrew term for covenant man or covenant people. Now actually, in Isaiah 49, 8, uh, the, the word brith is used, brith, and the word am is used, or britam. And I'd like to explain that. First, I'd like to read something from Davidi's book, The Tribes. Now, those of you who've seen the sermon I did on the Lost Tribes, notice I quoted that book occasionally, but here's a quote that I'd like to read. It says, in Hebrew, Brit Am, again, that's the word for covenant and the word for people, in northern dialects and in later spoken Hebrew would have been Britan, the final M being pronounced as N. Britain itself in old documents was sometimes rendered in English as Britannia. So, so again, very similar to the Hebrew words that were referred to in the Old Testament. Now I'd like to read something from the late Herbert W. Armstrong about this. He says, the most interesting fact is the Hebrew meaning of the names of the British people. The house of Israel is the covenant people. The Hebrew word for covenant is berith or breath. The Hebrew word for man is ish. In English, ish means of or belonging to a nation or people. In the original Hebrew language, vowels were never given in the spelling. So omitting the vowel e from Brith, but retain the I in its anglicized form to preserve the Y sound, we have an anglicized word for covenant, birth. The Hebrews, however, never pronounced their H's. Many a Jew, even today, pronouncing the name Shem, will call it Sem. Incidentally, this ancient Hebrew trait is also a British trait. The Hebrew word for covenant would be pronounced in its anglicized form as Brit, so not Brith which is what you'll look like, look at, for example, if you look at certain concordances, and in fact, I'll go to that in a moment, but Brit. So the Hebrew word for covenant seems to be anglicized as Brit. The word for covenant man or covenant people would therefore simply be British. So is it mere coincidence that the true covenant people today are called the British, and they reside in the British Isles? So that was some late Herbert Armstrong. Well, at minimum, of course, that suggests a link between the Hebrew as, uh, and, and, 
and the people of the British Isles. As I mentioned before, the word for people in various passages, such as Isaiah 49, 8, is the word, the Hebrew word, am. And that's Strong's word, uh, 5971. So that's Britam, or as it's been said, sometimes it's pronounced as Britain. Uh, even in the uh, northern parts of uh, the British Isles, according to uh, the writer Divity. And it likely means even more than that. I mentioned Isaiah 49, so why don't we go over there. Isaiah 49, and I'll read verse 8. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth and to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. So this term about uh, the covenant of the people is Brit Britain, actually, uh, with the, the two the uh, in between. And actually the word uh, the is not in the, uh, the original Hebrew. Now I'm going to read a definition of uh, the word translated as covenant. Now, uh, some people pronounce it berith or brit, and it, it comes, this is Strong's word 1285. It comes from Strong's word 1262 of cutting or confederacy of a covenant or a league. So it's a covenant, league, or confederacy. Well, there's been a covenant, league, or con confederacy, if you will, for the longest time between the United States, uh, United Kingdom, Australia, uh, New Zealand and Canada. As a matter of fact, with the uh, Snowden leaks of various U.S. classified documents, according to certain information that uh, the U.S. National Security Agency and other agencies had, the only close friends that the United States had were the British descended countries. Specifically, the only ones that were listed were Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. And so that's kind of interesting uh, because the United States has had a long time arrangement with them and they've had an arrangement with the United States and that's consistent with them being the, the covenant people. Now there's also a covenant uh, birth, if you will, made between God and the throne of David. Now I'm going to read several scriptures so you may want to follow along or these scriptures are at our website so if you go to the www.cogwriter.com website, uh, this information, a lot of the information I'm going to be going over is in that particular article. It also has a lot of more information. Okay, go into Psalm 89, starting in verse 3. God says, I've made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Verse 4, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So there's a promise there to David and his throne. Continuing down to verse 28 of Psalm 89. By mercy I will keep him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. So again, there's some type of a promise given to David and his throne. Now, I should comment here, some people believe that when Jesus arrived, he took, picked up the throne. But the uh, kingdom of Judah had been uh, eliminated long before then in terms of having their own king. Uh, we'll get into kind of when that happened later. So either this is, promise has been broken, which it is not, or somehow after uh, uh, Judah, Judah was... Uh, basically eliminated as it's a separate nation for a time, at least his kingdom was apparently eliminated from Israel, Jerusalem. It's supposed to exist. And we believe in the continuing Church of God that it existed through descendants that went to the British Isles. And we'll be getting to that in a moment, so you don't just have to take my word for it. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul says, prove all things, hold fast, which is good. And the Bible also encourages people to be like the uh, Bereans in the book of Acts, who search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. So what we're telling you here, feel free to look it up in your Bible, check and cross-check. Now some of you are already familiar with this idea, and so this isn't particularly new to you, but others, 
who are watching this, maybe it's the first time you've ever heard this, uh, or you've heard it and you have your doubts. So again, please check, check up on me. Go look this stuff up. Now, continuing Psalm 89, verse 34, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Verse 35, Once I have sworn to, by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as a sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. So again, another promise that this particular throne is going to endure. Go over to the book of Second Chronicles. In Second Chronicles chapter 13, I'm going to read uh, uh, verse 5. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons as a covenant, as by a covenant of salt? Furthermore, you go to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 23, starting in verse 1. Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised upon high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. He has made an everlasting covenant. So we see this everlasting covenant was made. Now, while I mentioned the term uh, covenant people before, the two Hebrew words are not used in, together in the same passage, of, same verse, other than in Isaiah 49, 8. But I would like to read something from uh, the book of Lamentations, uh, chapter uh, 4, verse 10, because they actually have words related to covenant and people in there. Now I'm going to read from the Young's literal translation. This is going to be an odd passage for some of you. The hands of merciful women have boiled their own children. They become food to them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. So this is, actually has derivatives of the Hebrew terms for covenant and people, or Britan. And you'll notice that this, there's destruction, they are boiling people. So this tells us, amongst other passages, that hard times are beginning coming to the descendants of uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, the covenant, the covenant people, the descendants of uh, Ephraim and Joseph. Now, we have a sermon about whether or not the Anglo-descended nations are going to become uh, slaves. And you can find that at the continuing COG uh, YouTube channel where uh, this particular sermon you're, you're now uh, listening to and watching uh, is. So you can, you can find that to get some more information about to get more information about that. Now I mentioned before that there was an end to the kings of Judah. Some have suggested that there's a Jeremiah connection and because of the prophet Jeremiah that he was involved in bringing the descendants of the royal throne into the British Isles. I'm going to read something, uh, read over, if you will, something from E.B. Benjamin from the 19th century. And he says, in Isaiah uh, 1.10, we have a commission given to Jeremiah in these words, quote, this, this would be from the Old King James Version, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. In tracing the prophet's history, his pulling down and destroying is clearly told, for, the, for his whole cry was the destruction of the nation of Judah and the conquest by the king of Babylon. Then he cites Jeremiah 40, verse 6. Jeremiah went with Gedaliah and dwelt with him. And he was, quote, the governor whom the king of Babylon had set over the land. That's verse 7 of Jeremiah 40. Now the governor was conquered by Ishmael of the seed royal. That's Jeremiah 41, 1. Who had joined the Ammonites, Ishmaelites, and carried off his captives. Captives. Now this next part in Jeremiah 41, 10 that he cites, very important. Even the king's daughters. Remember when we're reading all those promises to David about his throne lasting in his seed. A lot of people just looked at the males, but we have the king's daughters. And they were of uh, David's uh, seed. David was their great, great, great father, grandfather, however many generations they went back. Then uh, uh, E.B. Benjamin continues, Ishmael in his turn was conquered by Johanan, 
who took his captives with Jeremiah and the king's daughters to Shimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. That's Jeremiah 41.17. There they pretended to desire to know what the Lord wished them to do. Jeremiah said, through Jeremiah, they were told, don't go into Egypt. Jeremiah 41.19. Like many of a later date, they didn't do what they agreed to do. You can see that in uh, Jeremiah 43, 1 through 5. It's interesting, people don't believe God's prophets. They didn't believe in the past and believe, believe now. Uh, even though they said they would believe. They even told Jeremiah, if you tell us, don't go to Egypt, we'll go to Egypt. And when he tells them that, they saw, we're not going to listen to you. Uh, kind of reminds me of a lot of types of rationalization people have these days. So anyway, he refers to Jeremiah 43, 5, 6 and says, We may judge sorely against his will. Jeremiah and the king's daughter were taken into Egypt because they didn't want to go there. And this was against the direct command of God and the mission to Jeremiah to build and plant was not fulfilled. We may infer that the prophet escaped from Egypt at the earliest opportunity. And that's logical. Jeremiah said, don't go to Egypt. And they said, but we're going to go. And so Jeremiah went with them. So he finally left. And then E.B. Benjamin said he believed that doubtless ships of Dan, that's a tribe, you can refer to Judges 5.17, were still engaged in trade of that of Phoenicians in the trade of tin with Cornwall, that's over the British Isles. And one of Dan's ships, tradition tells us, Jeremiah his king's daughter and the stone, the Leophile, embarked. The Bible's silent on this subject only making it clear that somehow Jeremiah would do his mission. It was said that the vessel was wrecked on the coast of Spain, and there's a tradition in Spain that confirms this. Finally, 580 BC, the goal was reached, and the Tuatha da Danis welcomed to Tyrus Halls a great prophet and the eastern princess who brought them the heirloom of uh, Israel, Jacob's pillow. Now, let me comment about that. Many believe that the uh, rock or pillow that Jacob, Israel, had uh, when he went to sleep once and he saw a vision of angels going up and down a ladder ended up being a stone that was used as a coronation stone in Israel. And that particular stone was carried uh, by Jeremiah and or others into uh, Ireland or one of the, or the other... or, or or England, or somewhere in the British Isles. Ireland is the most normal place, they say, they originally arrived. Okay. A lot of these things are legends, and it's sort of difficult to determine. Now, some believe that the current stone that's there could not possibly have been stone from uh, the area of uh, uh, Judea. Uh, on the other hand, rocks do sometimes move, and it's hard to know for sure where, where it came from. Okay, but anyway, Jewish tradition tells us the stone had been preserved in the temple as a pillar of the witness between Jacob and his God. Again, I'm reading from E.B. Benjamin. Irish tradition, Irish tradition tells of the beauty of the princess, but this could be some other. Tepha the beautiful, and of her grave, of the college established by the prophet, of the city and the nation that he built and planted, in the grandeur of Tara's halls, and he, he says they sing about this. Now, as far as the king's daughters go, it should be mentioned that one king, uh, Jehoiakim, and a prince, Kodanai of Judah, were told that their descendants would not occupy the throne of David. And you can read that in Jeremiah 36, 30, 22, 24 through 30. And that might be part of why King Zedekiah's daughters are mentioned in Scripture in Jeremiah 41:10. In Jeremiah 43 6 so instead of going to Jehoiakim and Konaniah who guys it's, I'm not it's not going through you it's logical and necessary that it would have gone through the king's daughters and again the belief is that the, the king's daughters did make it up into the British Isles now I'd like to read some other uh, passages of scripture uh, to think about related to the uh, throne of David. And uh, you, can, you can follow along with me or just let me, you can listen to me read them. First one, just going to be one verse, it's from uh, 1 Kings 2, verse 45. 
King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So Solomon knew the promise that the throne was supposed to be established forever. Now if you go to Jeremiah 22, verse 2, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, you who sit in the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Now let's also go over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we see it's also mentioned in the prophets that the throne was supposed to be established. It's in the Psalms and the prophets and other parts of the Bible. And it's going back to Jeremiah, this time Jeremiah 23, starting verse 5. says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. So that last couple of passages make it clear that the throne of David was supposed to last, but that Jesus is going to sit on it, but Jesus isn't doing it yet. The children of Israel aren't dwelling safely right now. Now since scripture cannot be broken, as Jesus said in uh, John uh, 10 35, someone's gotta be on that throne now. And so it would have been somebody who would have been related to King Zedekiah because, again, the throne was not supposed to pass through uh, uh, Jehoiakim. Now you say, okay, you believe this now, but didn't all this stuff really come from the 19th century? Uh, well, no, but th there are 19th century connections. And part of the reason there's 19th century connections is that the 19th century uh, the British peoples received a variety of blessings. They received all kinds of territories. If you watch the sermon, it's also at the Continuing COG channel on the Ten Lost Tribes. I go into various territories that the uh, uh, British received in the uh, 19th century and 1800s. But also, I should probably point out that in the late uh, Middle Ages in Transylvania, they believed that Christ would, quote, take... Uh, uh, David's thrown upon his return. Uh, so this was not an uncommon idea, but as far as being able to know that the British were the ones, back then uh, the, there, there, were, there were different ones who wrote that the, the British had descended from Israel and all that type of a thing. But until the blessings were obvious, it wasn't as obvious to everybody. Now, it might be of interest to note that when the uh, monarchs had been crowned, over uh, Ireland or uh, uh, England, uh, the, the, in Britain, mostly in Britain, but uh, it's actually similar to the ceremonies that were used by uh, the tribe of Judah and the children of Israel to crown their kings. So I'd like to just comment that uh, this is one of the, one of the things that that, that that was going on. Now, before going further into that, I would like to go over to uh, uh, the book of Deuteronomy. So let's go to Deuteronomy 33. And this one I'm going to turn with you there. Because I'd like to read something from the book of Deuteronomy. And I'm going to uh, start in verse 13. Deuteronomy uh, 33, verse 13. And of Joseph, he said, now this is a blessing again from Israel or Jacob to his children. Blessed of the Lord is his land with the precious things of heaven, with the dew and the deep lying beneath, with the precious fruits of the sun and the precious produce of the months, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of the everlasting hills, with the precious things of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. And the, the old British Commonwealth, that, the British Empire included mountains and bush and uh, precious things and things from the sun and things beneath. Continuing, let the blessing come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. 
His glory is like a firstborn bull, and his horns like the horns of a wild ox. Together with them he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. Well, what people had the ends of the earth? Some of you might recall that there used to be an expression that the sun never set on the British Empire. And it didn't. It was the only empire that big. The only empire that stretched around the whole world like that. Uh, in certain respects, it was the greatest empire of all time. Anyways, they are the tens, thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. Now, as far as uh, this, he's, he's like a firstborn bull. So it's interesting that even though the promise of the scepter, the promise to be king, was given to Judah, typically it would be to a firstborn. And Judah wasn't the firstborn either. Uh, it was Reuben who lost it. But notice it says that Ephraim is going to be like the firstborn bull. And in uh, Jeremiah 31, 9 through 10, Scripture says that God says, Ephraim is my firstborn. Well, we have a situation where the king's daughters came into Ephraim, essentially, uh, and we the, then uh, they intermarried, and so within uh, Ephraim, through Judah, was was a scepter. And again, these are descendants of David. Uh, daughters are descendants of fathers, just as much as sons are. And so we see that. Now, as far as the throne of David, I'd like to uh, uh, make a few comments. If you take your Bibles and go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, I'd like to read something from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Because God made a remarkable promise to King David of Israel. And he did this through Nathan the prophet. And God told David, quote, Jeremiah, excuse me, 2 Samuel uh, 7 verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I'll set up your seed after you who will come from your body and will establish his kingdom. I will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chase them with a rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. And your house and your kingdom will be established forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. So God's saying, look, even though I took it away from Saul, and your descendants are going to be, not be so good all the time. I'm going to punish them. You're still going to have that. Now, some people act like God's promise has fallen, but it has not. And I'd like to comment again that Irish history uh, records some of this story. It tells of Prophet Jeremiah coming with his scribe Baruch to Ireland after the fall of Judah. So notice it happened after the fall of Judah. So Judah falls. The king of told he's not his line is over but there's the daughters from the other king anyway it says the Barak uh, came to Baruch came to Ireland after the fall of Judah with a young princess in a coronation stone called the Gaelic Leophile in ancient Irish records the princess was named uh, Tia Tefi she married the son of the high king of Ireland Okay, so she married into the, their royal line. Their descendants reigned from Tara in Ireland for many centuries. Later, in the days of Kenneth MacAlpine, they transferred their place of rule to Scone in Scotland. The same dynasty continues down today. This is according to uh, evangelist, a late evangelist, uh, John O'Gwyn, in the person of Queen Elizabeth II, a direct descendant of Tia Tefi and her husband. So he said that, you know, God's fulfilled his promise to, to David, just as he said. So th that throne exists up until now. People should consider if that throne still exists, and that all those ties for all those thousands of years, how could that happen? And I don't believe it's coincidental. God said it was going to happen. God made it happen. Now, I'd like to read something from uh, the late Herbert Humphrey Armstrong. He said, uh, David succeeded Saul. David sat on the eternal's throne. David's son Solomon succeeded him, also sitting on the eternal's throne. And then he quotes uh, First Corinthians, excuse me, First Chronicles twenty nine twenty three. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the eternal as king instead of David his father. 
And Herbar says, I want to impress a special point. Before Saul, the Eternal had been king over Israel. These human kings are sitting on the Eternal's throne. The, the Eternal, or Lord, in all four caps, as it says, is Jesus Christ, who was with the Father before the world was. Jesus, both the root and the offspring of David. Uh, Revelation 22, 16. Since he was the root, the throne was his before David was born. David merely sat on the eternal throne. Secondly, since Jesus was David's lawful fleshly son, that same throne shall become his right by inheritance, continuing David's dynasty. So when Christ returns to earth, David's throne will doubly be his right. Now we come to an incredible fact. Fantastic, Herbert Armstrong says. Almost unbelievable, but true. When David was king, God made him a perpetual covenant, unconditionally, which God cannot and will not break. It's even more amazing uh, and less understood than the covenant he made with Abraham. He says, I want you to plant firmly in your mind the specific nature and character of the covenant the Almighty made with David. For this is a vital link in the purposes and mission of Christ, and it's an important key to understanding the Bible. In 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 5, we find, excuse me, 1 and 5, we find, quote, Now these be the last words of David. God hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. In other words, a covenant that's going to endure forever and cannot fail. Now there's an old legend that puts a connection between the first Scottish kings and the children of Israel. I'm going to read a 19th century report from it, from something called the Christian Remembrancer, from 1864. We've seen a late work on prophecy gravely affirming the prophet Jeremiah died in Ireland, having been forced there by the wandering sons of Ephraim. One of the few unquestioned facts connected with early Irish history is the intercourse between Ireland and the Phoenicians through Spain. The Israelitish settlers, according to tradition, carried with them Jacob's pillar, or pillow, known as a leophile, or the stone of destiny, which secured a perpetual monarchy to the people, so happy as to possess it. This stone, at the crown of the first king of Scots of Scotland, was borrowed. So that legend is interesting because it ties Ephraim in with the British Isles, it ties Jeremiah in. And, of course, we mentioned in Jeremiah 43, you've got the king's daughters coming there. And I mentioned this before, and you don't have to go there, but in uh, Genesis 49, verse 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So the, the right to be king, if you will. And in 1 Kings 9, 5, it says, I promised David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man on the throne of David. Now, that Davidic kingdom ended in Judah centuries before Christ came, probably around 586 B.C. Uh, thus, there had to be some way for the British descendants to keep ruling. And, you know, God's word is not going to be broken, as it says in uh, John 10.35. And therefore, somehow it had to happen. It happened through the people of the covenant. Now, I'd like to comment about something that the Duke of York, who was later crowned King George VI of England. Uh, he was king actually from uh, 1936 till his death, February of uh, 1952. Here's what he uh, reportedly wrote in 1922. Quote, I am sure the British Israelite business is true. I have read a lot about it lately and everything, no matter how large or small, points to our being the chosen race. Why is that important? It's interesting because the last king of England said that he was believed in the British Israelite connection and he was a descendant. You say, so? He could have just felt that way. True. But as the King of England, and the one who was going to become the King of England at that time when he wrote it, he had access to all kinds of other documents. You know, everything in the world is actually not on the internet. <laughs> There's, they have all kinds of records and archives and whatever. And he could have looked and he'd have access to stuff that perhaps we haven't, haven't reported here. And plus he could have asked relatives and he could have also done some other things. And so he believed in it. Again, that of itself is not proof, but it's certainly interesting. Now I mentioned something before, and I should have uh, not mentioned it when I did, I just waited until now, and that's that there's similarities between the anointing of the monarch of England and the uh, 
those of ancient Israel. So I'd like to read uh, something from uh, Turner's History of the Anglo-Saxons from the earliest periods of Norman Conquest. This came out in 1886. Here he shall be anointed with oil, and this anthem shall be sung. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon, king in Zion. And approaching him, they said, May the king live forever. The scepter be given to him, the rod be given to him. And he who is the king of David, the scepter of the house of Israel. He who opens and no one can shut. He who shuts and no one can open. This was part of the coronation ceremony of Ethelred II from the late 10th century. What I've just said here, anointed the oil just like David, uh, uh, with Nathan the prophet, etc. Those were part of the ceremony. And in the Bible, you can see that ancient kings were anointed. It says that in 1 Samuel 15, 1 and uh, 1 Kings 1, 34. And it was with oils, it says, in 1 Samuel 16, 13. And the, the uh, scepters were recognized in the Bible as a uh, symbol for ruling. I mentioned uh, Genesis 49, 10 a few moments ago, and you can also look at Ezekiel 19, 14. And again, sometimes I go through these scriptures a little bit fast. You can go to the C-O-G-W-R-I-T-E-R -E website, cogwriterwebsite.com, and the scriptures are listed there and references, and so you can, you can do more research on your own if you want. And the key of David is mentioned in Isaiah uh, 22, 22, as well as uh, in the book of Revelation uh, 3, verse 7. Having all of these as part of a coronation ceremony is probably more than just a simple coincidence. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, people such as Herbert Armstrong and those of us in continuing Church of God believe that this promise was not broken, that uh, God gave to David and his descendants, and that Queen Elizabeth II is a descendant of David, as are uh, her son Charles and his son William. Now, I've alluded to this before, but the Bible is clear that the royal family will be replaced by uh, Jesus when he returns. Now, Jesus calls himself, is called the son of David in uh, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. I want to start with that. But if you go to the New Testament, the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 32, we're going to read something here. He will be great and called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom there will be no end. And we can see this furthermore in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Re Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. This is actually, when I'm reading the scriptures, actually one of my favorite verses. I kind of just, it just makes me just kind of stop when I get to it. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the scripture is in Luke and in Revelation teach us that Jesus is going to a throne and he will get the throne of David and that's what the Bible teaches. And I mentioned before about this being God's throne. I heard Armstrong had said that. Um, oh, if you want, we'll go to the book of Chronicles. One verse in 1 Chronicles uh, 29. Then we're going to go to 2 Chronicles. So 1 Chronicles uh, 29 Verse 23. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. Notice Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David. Now in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8, we're going to see something similar. 2 Chronicles 9, verse 8. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne to be king for the Lord your God. Well, Jesus hasn't returned yet, so until he does so, uh, it's been, this throne has been under the, uh, uh, the, the British uh, line. Uh, there's some passages I'm not going to go through now talking about what may happen to them toward the end. But again, these people are the people of the, of the covenant. They're, they're the covenant people. And covenant was made to David about his throne. And the throne 
they intermarried in with with these particular people. And this is the longest standing kingdom that I'm aware of on, on the earth. And again, tying it into uh, from from David all the way up to uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Now, it's not only the people who completely consider themselves British that I want to talk about. Um, the Scottish are also British, uh, as are the descendants of uh, in the main peoples in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, just to make a comment, the word Scott is uh, derived from Sith, which is spelled S-C-Y-T-H. Um, Webster's Dictionary says we're supposed to pronounce this Sith, but others would pronounce this Scott. He traveled to Scotland via Spain and Ireland. Prior to the Del Riadic migration of the Scots from Ireland to Scotland, the northern area of Scotland was known as Scotia, which is sort of similar to Scythia or Scythia. These people simply carried a name and they went to the highlands of, of Scotland. Now, what about the people in Australia and New Zealand? If you take your Bibles, I want you to go to the book of Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. I'm going to read verse 12. Now, I think a lot of people in Australia and New Zealand are familiar with this particular passage. Um, but I'm not so convinced that people in the rest of the world have paid a lot of attention to it. Some, of them, some may know. And of course, not everybody in Australia and New Zealand uh, has looked at this. Anyway, Isaiah 49, starting verse 12. Or just reading verse 12. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and west, and those from the land of Sinim. S-I-N-I-M. Now, the Latin Vulgate of the Bible... Uh, which would have been by uh, the Catholic Jerome. This land of Sinem, he translates as D or De, De Terra Australe. And that's pretty much where uh, the word uh, Australia comes from. It basically derives from the word uh, Southern. Some people also used to call it the land of Oz. And uh, read something from Wikipedia. It says, Legends of Terra Australis Incognita, the unknown land of the south, date back to Roman times and were commonplace in medieval geography. Following the European discovery, people decided that we're going to call it Terra Aust Australis. So this, this must be the unknown land of the south that we've all been wondering about. The earliest recorded use of the word Australia in English was supposed to be from about 1625. It was a note of Australia the Espirito Santo, written by Sir Richard Hocklut. And so in, uh, there's a Dutch adjective for it, which was Australisch. It was used in the Dutch book in Jakarta in 1638. Jakarta's in Indonesia, the Dutch were over there, to refer to the newly discovered lands of the south. Australia was later used in a translation of a French book in uh, eight, excuse me, 1676. Now, I'd like to read something that the late Herbert Armstrong wrote about uh, this, referring to Isaiah 49, verse 12. And this is from his booklet called The United States Written in Prophecy. Referring to the house of Israel, not Judah, he says, look to Isaiah 49, 3 through 6. God says, quote, Behold, these shall come from afar, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. In Hebrew, the language in which was, this was originally inspired, there is no word for northwest, but the term is designated by the phrase the north and the west. It literally means the northwest. The, the Vulgate, which I mentioned before, renders Sinem as Australi or Australia. Now we have the location uh, northwest of Jerusalem and even spreading around the world. And what he's referring to there is if you go northwest of Jerusalem, you end up to the British Isles. But if you go to the ends of the earth or to the far south, about as far away as you could be, uh, you would be in Australia and New Zealand, which is even farther away, and is also to the south. Uh, 
they are fairly far. I've uh, been to Australia once, and we've been to uh, uh, New Zealand twice. Matter of fact, we're New Zealand Feast of Tabernacles uh, in uh, 2013. Now, I've looked at other writers who've gone into this. Some believe that this has to do with Sinem, means it's the land of China. But other things say, no, it's supposed to be south of China. And because of that, they think this may point to Australia or New Zealand. Uh, certainly, Australia and New Zealand are in the southern hemisphere, and they're past China from uh, many parts of the world, especially over in Jerusalem, it would be past, past China. And that doesn't prove that Isaiah 49 has to be referring to Australia and New Zealand. And the fact that it's called, uh, one of the places is called Australia, <laughs> is interesting. But the Bible did say that the British people were going to spread around, uh, around the world. Uh, prophecies referring to islands also refer to them. Australia and New Zealand are also islands. Uh, there's uh, at least, well, the two main islands I'm aware of in Australia is the main island as well as Tasmania. And then over in New Zealand, there's the North and South Island. There's also little smaller islands over there. I don't want to uh, leave any of these, these things out. But these blessings were promised to the children of Israel. However, and that's why they ended up with the land, they also were warned that things would happen to them if they disobeyed. And this doesn't just happen for now, and I'm going to go into the future later, not in this sermon, but another one. But in the old times, in ancient times, when they were taken away, if you go to the book of 2 Kings chapter 17, uh, basically because they used pagan forms of worship, they were, they were taken away. So I'm going to read starting in verse uh, 7, I guess, of 2 Kings chapter 17. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel which they had made. Verse 23. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it was to this day. Now, there are other records of history in Jewish records that from the land of uh, Assyria, they went into the area known as uh, uh, Scythia, and eventually they ended up over into the British Isles, and then as modern historians will recognize, and pretty much everybody recognizes, the uh, Australians uh, came, well, not the Aboriginal Australians, but the other, the, the main number of people in Australia, uh, came from uh, Britain. It was originally a penal colony. Uh, Captain Cook had uh, been to New Zealand in those areas, uh, in the South Pacific, and the, the British people put and planted their people in those areas, and they and they grew. Um, I'd also like to say that some have brought up this idea. Of, well, yeah, but the DNA evidence disproves it. Well, that's actually not the case, and this is tricky. I'm going to cite some DNA evidence that says that it absolutely does prove it, but I'm also going to put a little caution on this. I don't think that everything to know with a DNA analysis is fully understood at this time. But there are some, some scientists and professors who believe uh, that they can uh, demonstrate this. For example, in, in 2010 it was reported, quote, that when the teams of geneticists led by Professor Brian Sykes took DNA samples in the Celtic regions of Britain. They discovered ancestries in the Caucasus, which lie within ancient Scythia in the Mediterranean Europe. So that's some modern support with the idea that, okay, they went from Israel to Assyria into Scythia, and then they came into Britain. So that's with some DNA evidence. Now I'd like to read something else called haplogroup R1b. Uh, so this is a bit complicated. Uh, Atlantic modal haplotype 3. The most common variant of the Atlantic modal haplotype in the YHRD database has DYS3891, excuse 39iii values 13 and 29, etc. There's, there's a bunch of these, so uh, I don't expect to be able to take the, the notes, because I, I I know I talk fast at times. But if you want the real specifics on this, uh, there's a link 
uh, over at uh, the website, you, you can get this detail. It says, this uh, haploid type differs by one step upward. It's very interesting from the perspective of the YHRD database because the most top frequencies are not in Europe, but in the United States. Now, wait a second. Most people think the Euro that the United States is just a bunch of uh, mixed Europeans. Well, we and the Church of God have taught for a long time, true, that they were in Europe. But there was something different about a lot of the Europeans who came into America. And that they were different, and this, this particular genetic evidence shows that. So of the top 20, 12 are among the U.S. populations. Uh, two are Hispanic, three are African American, and the rest are European American. So this is most of them. These samples seem to congregate in areas of the U.S. settled by the French, Scottish, English, Irish, and, Im and German immigrants. And this is a shows a Western European origin of AMH in Southern Ireland and London. England appears to be among the top ten European frequencies, along with four separate locales in the Netherlands. So what this is basically saying is that uh, there were different types of people who ended up in the British Isles, and there were different types of people who ended up in the United States. And the ones in the United States, there's a difference between them and a lot of the Europeans. I was reading a work uh, that's also referred to in, in the paper. I'm not going to uh, get to it today, but by the late uh, Raymond McNair. He was an evangelist in the uh, uh, Worldwide Church of God, uh, Global Church of God, uh, Living Church of God, and uh, Church of God 21st Century. He said that there were skull differentiations between most of the Germans who came to the United States and those who stayed in Germany. And there are other reports that were differences between the Germans that came over. Why do I mention that? Because some critics of uh, the British Israel theory say, wait a second, the United States almost adopted German as its language because there were so many people who came over here from Germany. And while it's true there are a lot of people who came over here from Germany, many of them have a, uni a unique uh, gene pool that is different from the other Germans. Skull differentiations, different from the other Germans. So the, the, there is evidence within DNA, skull structures, and other ways, including migration patterns, to demonstrate that the uh, British and American peoples uh, were somehow different. Now, there's a scripture that I've also quoted somewhere else that I don't recall off the top of my head, but basically what that scripture says is God can sort everything out. God can see through things that we, we don't. And so it took time. And in time, once the British Empire rose up, it was, should have been obvious to anybody who believed Bible prophecy that since there's supposed to be a fulfillment of a company of nations to Ephraim and this great vast wealth that was going to spread around the world, that happened with the British Empire, unlike any empire happened before. So that was, was proof to people. Again, people are going to argue about DNA evidence back and forth, but the reality is there is DNA evidence, there's other evidence, and just look at the lessons of history. Somehow, God, the promises had to be made. God's word cannot be broken. We went through the fact that the throne of David has been existing. And they, even the last king of Israel, the last king of uh, uh, England, uh, of Great Britain, the United Kingdom, he believed in it as well, that he was a descendant. And we've also got uh, the, DNA, the DNA evidence, etc. Now, of course, I've been talking a lot about the physical covenant. Well, what about the spiritual covenant? And, you know, how did uh, uh, Christianity get to the British Isles? You know, we know that in Hebrews uh, 9, 8, excuse me, 9, 15, talks about a better covenant. And it's the new covenant that's talked about in Hebrews 8, 6 and Hebrews 7, 22. There's a lot of different views about how true Christianity got into the British Isles. Uh, one view is that uh, the Apostle Philip uh, allegedly ordained uh, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, who's mentioned in uh, Matthew uh, 27, 57 to 30. They sent him to the British Isles, but that's not certain. Here's something else I'm going to read from a book called, uh, from an article called Joseph of Arimathea from the International Standard uh, Bible Encyclopedia. It says, uh, legends record that Joseph was sent to 
by Philip from Gaul to Britain, along with 11 other disciples in 63 AD. And that might be. But I want to caution people. Uh, someone uh, had sent me uh, uh, a book, or had suggested a book, and I went and I read the book, that indicated that the uh, all kinds of things about Joseph of Arimathea, and it was just absolutely supposed to be fact, etc. And I attempted to uh, verify that, and I'd hoped to be able to verify that, and I could not. So I would just just say that you know some of this stuff, there is certain evidence. We know that true Christianity got there, and we knew it would get there. Uh, one of the reasons is, for example, in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 5 through 6, Jesus had told uh, his disciples, do not go to the way of the Gentiles, don't enter the city of Samaritans, but go to the, rather to the last sheep of the tribe of the house of Israel. So that was at first. So Jesus had gone out and said, okay, you're supposed to try to reach the descendants of Israel. Then later in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And because there was trade going on with uh, the British Isles, particularly because of tin, which was very important, and there wasn't found too many places. And by the way, tin is still one of the more expensive of the more common metals. Um, so it was, it was important back then. Uh, there, it was logical that people would end up going over there. Uh, in Galatians 2, verses 6 through 8, you don't have to go there, but the Apostle Paul said to him was given the uh, gospel of the uncircumcised and to Peter, the, to the circumcised. And in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2, Peter said that uh, he wrote to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, their father. The dispersion or diaspora is a term to, for Israelites who are not in the land of uh, Israel. Some believe the Apostle Paul made it there. I've looked at various sources on this. Um, most of them are kind of second or third hand accounts. But I would like to read something from the historian uh, Eusebius. This is a fourth century historian. It says that uh, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were to preach the name of Jesus and to teach about his marvelous deeds in country and town that some of them should take possession of the Roman Empire and the Queen City itself, and others in the Persian, and others in Ar Armenian, and others should go to the Parthian race. Uh, at some point in time, maybe I'll do a whole thing on par the Parthians and the Scythians. And yet others to Scythian, and that some should reach the very ends of the world, should have reached the lands of the Indians, and some have crossed the ocean and reached the Isles of Britain. So it was believed that they went to the Isles of Britain, now, I'd like to read something from a Seventh-day Baptist uh, writing. Uh, this has to do uh, with uh, the planting, early planting of, planting of Christianity in the British Isles. This is the section I'm looking at. This came from uh, the Sabbath in the British Isles from 1910. That Christianity was established in Britain between 51 to 61 AD, either by the Apostle Paul himself or by converts made by him during his Roman imprisonment, it's the testimony of many credible historians that it happened. Gildas, the earliest British writer born in 520 AD, so again, this is several centuries later, that's why I said, even though we know that it got there, we're not 100% sure yet, perhaps as more information comes out, um, maybe I'll be uh, more certain. Anyway, he says the introduction came to the islands, quote, Meanwhile, these islands stiff with cold and frost, and in the distant region of the world, remote from the visible sun, <laughs> reached the beams of light, that is the holy precepts of Christ, that is the true sun, S-U-N, who shows to the whole world his splendor, uh, not only from the temporal firmament, but from the height of the heaven, which surpasses everything temporal. At the latter part, as we know, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, by whom his religion was propagated without impediment. End quote. Then he said, then the Seventh-day Baptist writes, compared to this with the previous passage, the events mentioned before, the meanwhile is a period between the defeat of Boadicea in 61 AD, on the one hand, and other events not too far distant, such as the defeat of Caracactus in 51 AD. Therefore, the testimony of Gildas is the effect that the gospel was preached in Britain before the year 61. 
Um, there's also a writing that I've seen by a, a Vatican uh, a librarian by the name of Cardinal uh, Baronius that uh, suggests that uh, he wrote in the Middle Ages that this happened. Also, the Anglican Bishop uh, Usher uh, said that several of the apostles and, and or their companions went to uh, the Isles as well. Now, possibly the earliest re well, writing, one of the earliest writings that says this happened somehow it was by Hippolytus. Now, Hippolytus was a third century uh, theologian and a, a bishop, actually, of Rome. Uh, he was considered an anti-pope. On, on one hand, on the other hand, uh, he's considered a saint by the Church of Rome and considered to be for its greatest theologian prior to the time of Constantine, uh, according to uh, one, one quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Well, anyway, he said... These two belong to the 70 disciples who were gathered. Oh, a while back I referred to Jesus' comments in Matthew 10, 5 through 6. This is when he sent out the 70 disciples. So there's a legend about the 70. And he said that uh, there were a couple of them were scattered. Then he refers to one of them. This is Hippolytus. Again, he probably wrote this in the early 3rd century. Aristobulus, Aristobulus, I'll say it again, Bishop of Britain. So he, according to what Hippolytus heard in the early 3rd century, was uh, one of the original 70 who knew Jesus and that he, was, he went to Britain. I don't know if that's an absolute fact, but that certainly is a fact that this is what Hippolytus wrote. And uh, so this is evidence that uh, an early introduction of Christianity to the British Isles and we know that uh, there were 70 and that they would have known the, the apostles. The other part that's interesting to note, however, is the form of Christianity that made it into the British Isles was not the Greco-Roman form that people know now. There's uh, all kinds of information about the, the Celtic Church. I'd like to read uh, something by uh, W. Dawson called The Celtic Church in English Christianity. It says, the Celtic churches of Ireland, of Galloway, and Iona were at one with the British church. These claimed, like southern Gaul and Spain, to have drawn their faith from the apostolic see of Ephesus. The apostolic see of Ephesus, most of you are not particularly familiar with that unless you've been following uh, what I've been saying or my writings. I mean, you could have run into other places, but I tend to talk about it a lot. And that is, uh, the apostle John died in Ephesus. He was the last apostle to die. And it's believed he appointed Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, to, uh, as his successor. And there's a, a line of leaders or bishops or pastors uh, from there. And notice that those in the uh, uh, British churches said that they had ties to the Apostolic See of Ephesus. So they had some kind of contact uh, with the people in Asia Minor. And that's actually the area that had apostolic succession, who actually held to the original faith, at least until sometime into the uh, third century. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. This is where the Celtic churches say they've gotten it. Now, I'd like to read a couple things from the famous uh, historian uh, Philip Schaff. He's talking about the period from 549 to 1049. The term cold D has been improperly applied to the whole Celtic church and superior Purity has been claimed for it. There is no doubt that the Columban or Celtic Church of Scotland, as well as the early, early Irish and early British churches, differed in many points from the medieval and modern Church of Rome and represent a simpler, yet very active missionary type of Christianity. Simpler? No, more accurate. Missionary type? Yes. We're supposed to go to all the world and preach the gospel to everybody. That's one of the things we're doing in the uh, continuing Church of God. So here's a few peculiarities, according to uh, Philip Schaff, who I believe is a Protestant writer. Here's how they're distinct. They were independent of the Pope, and so they didn't do that. They were not bound by uh, rules of celibacy. They didn't have the kind of uh, civil authority that the bishops had. They celebrated the time of Easter different. That means Passover. That's what they're referring to. 
the form of the tonsure, which is a type of cutting that uh, the monks did, which is not biblical. It's actually warned against. It's also been asserted that the Celts or Coldies were opposed to auricular confession, that's uh, uh, confessing out loud to a priest. We also have a sermon about that at the uh, uh, Continuing COG uh, YouTube channel that you can uh, watch, as well as an article about it uh, at the cogwriter.com website. The worship of saints, the, the, the Chaldees and the Celts were opposed to, and images, they were against purgatory, uh, transubstantiation, and, and uh, the Catholic view of the seven sacraments. So all of these are held by the people in the area of uh, Britain. And actually, uh, something else I'd like to read from the British monk and historian uh, known as the, uh, the Venerable uh, Bede. Uh, he said about the group of church leaders that were in Britain, they do not keep Easter Sunday at the proper time, but from the 14th. The 14th, what's that mean? If you have a Church of God background, you realize that we keep Passover on the 14th of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, the month that God says is the beginning of year of the month, the first month for Him. The And many people will be surprised to learn this. And I grew up Roman Catholic, and I didn't know this. I did not realize that Easter Sunday was supposed to be Passover. Now, that'll sound bizarre for those of you who are all familiar with the Passover. So Passover, uh, Jesus broke the bread. Uh, they had the foot washing, they drank, had, had the wine. Uh, and so Passover was not a resurrection holiday um, or, or observance. Uh, Passover, uh, which uh, we in the Continuing Church of God keep on the 14th every year as prescribed by Scripture, uh, was not done as a commemoration of, of a resurrection. But what happened with Rome is first they changed the day. Uh, and actually, for a while, they were keeping it at Saturday night uh, because days start at sunset. Uh, but then they kept it Sunday during the day. And then over time, it switched from being uh, a, a, a risk of slight offense here, a Last Supper type of uh, presentation. Um, and at the, by Last Supper, I don't mean when Jesus and his disciples had the meal, but I'm talking again about the bread and wine afterwards. But I use the term Last Supper for those who may have a Catholic or Protestant background to convey uh, some of what, what, what night I'm referring to, the same night that Jesus broke, broke the bread. But that was all lost. Growing up as a Roman Catholic, I had no idea that Easter Sunday had anything to do with Passover. Well, I knew that, uh, I'd heard about the Last Supper, and I knew it was a few days beforehand, but again, I didn't realize that supposedly Easter was that. And obviously, the way it's kept by pretty much everyone who keeps Easter, they don't realize it as well. Anyway, continuing from, the, from Bede, they did other things too, which were not keeping with the unity of the church. So he's complaining about people in the British Isles that don't do what the Church of Rome likes. After a long dispute, they were unwilling, in spite of prayers, exportations and rebukes of Augustine and his companions to give their assent, preferring their own traditions to those which all the churches of the world agree in Christ. Now, I will comment right now. Bede was wrong. All the churches in, in Christ didn't agree with the Roman changes. The, church, the true churches of Christ never adopted Easter Sunday. They never changed Passover. They didn't do any of those kinds of things. So, But it's interesting. From the time of Augustine, who was also a Catholic saint, uh, so it's late 4th, early 5th century. It was clear that there were those in Britain who kept Passover on the 14th. They held the practices that the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox uh, no longer held. And by the way, at that time when Bede was writing this, the Eastern Orthodox uh, were in full communion, if you will, with the Church of, of Rome. So that's why I'm saying everywhere. But actually it's the people they're calling heretics uh, who is what they're complaining about. Throughout history, there have been people who've kept Church of God doctrine, including Passover on the 14th, uh, etc. I did a, a sermon on the Apostle John that uh, is also at the Continuing COG uh, uh, website, uh, excuse me, channel. Uh, there too. You can, get it, you can get it from the ccog.org website under sermons as well, that's true. But it's at the uh, Continuing COG uh, YouTube channel. The, 
there's something that Bede wrote that was stated by uh, a Catholic abbot named Wilfred. And there was a debate because the king wanted to know if Passover was supposed to be on the 14th or Passover was supposed to be on a Sunday. Well, there were some who were somewhat, somewhat faithful still in the British Isles who kept saying it should be on the 14th. Now, some of those who were saying it should be on the 14th, they compromised in other areas. So I'm not certain that they were in the Church of God at the time. But basically, uh, what uh, Abbot uh, Wilfred said, he says, far be it for me to charge John, that's the Apostle John, with foolishness. He literally observed the decrees of the Mosaic Law when the church was still Jewish in many respects. At a time when the apostles were unable to bring a sudden end to that law which God ordained. They feared, of course, to make, they might make a stumbling block for the Jewish proselytes. So it says, so John, according to the custom of the law, so in other words, what the Bible says, began the celebration of the Easter day in the evening of the 14th of the first month, no matter where it fell on the Sabbath or any other day. So he understood and admitted that it came from the Bible, but said John was afraid and he wouldn't go any further, which is ridiculous. But my point is, the reality is somehow the true church must have gotten into uh, Britain in an early time because it hadn't gotten there into an early time. How else would they would come up with the idea of going on the 14th? Um, I'd like to read something from a Catholic priest and a theologian, uh, R. Uh, McBrien. As a matter of fact, I emailed him back and forth too. It says, Pope Vitalin supported the efforts of the king of North Umbria, that's in British Isles, following the Synod of Whitby in 664 to establish in England the Roman as opposed to the Celtic date for Easter, that is the Sunday after Jewish Passover, rather than the Passover itself and other Roman practices as well. Notice, even the Catholics say it's the Sunday after Passover instead of Passover is when they do Passover, which I think is absolutely absurd. Uh, there's also evidence that there was Sabbath keeping there till at least 886 and I found other evidence that has gone into, was into the Middle Ages in there. Uh, if you want more information on that, uh, again go to the article at the cogwriter.com uh, website. It's, it's all there for you. But what I've been trying to emphasize in terms of this, this sermon is some of the aspects of the covenant. Jacob, Israel, made promises to Ephraim and Manasseh. They received the blessings. They're also subject to the curses. This is one of the reasons to understand the identity of the covenant peoples is to understand uh, near-term events in terms of prophetically, as well as to understand what's going to happen in the future. Sadly, many, especially along the Protestant world, consider that the promises made uh, to the children of Israel were not really fulfilled. They don't realize that uh, God's promises to, to David were going to be fulfilled in Christ when he returns the, the second time, not the first time. Because if it was the first time, there was too many gaps of centuries between when there was a descendant of uh, David who was king or queen. Yet, because Jeremiah had the king's daughters, and there's evidence within history to show that they did make it to the British Isles. We know that God's word cannot be broken. It's an interesting coincidence, or more than that, I believe, that the term Britain means uh, covenant people in uh, Hebrew, or British means covenant men in Hebrew. I'd like to... Uh, my, the last, sermon, last scripture I'd like to give in the sermon is in the book of Hosea. And I'd like to read something else. The, the people of the, of the United States and Anglo-Saxon lands have the Bible. We should know what it says. We should have no excuse to not obey. But sadly, we are rebelling more and more. I, I, Hosea 11.3, the first part said, I taught Ephraim to walk. Skip down to verse 5. But the Assyrians shall be his king, because they refuse to repent. And the sword shall slash in his cities, devour his districts, and consume them because of their counsels. Verse 7. My people are bent on backsliding from me, though they call to the Most High, not at all exalt him. And we even have, in modern times, people who believe it's okay to be practicing homosexuals and say that they're Christian. People who believe that abortion is right and they claim to be Christian, especially political leaders. 
the prophesied shame that God has talked about is starting to happen on the uh, Anglo-American powers. Without re repentance, increased pride is occurring amongst the covenant peoples. Other nations do have their sins, and they're going to be uh, punished uh, later. Now, the new covenant is a better covenant. We know this, and it says that in uh, the book of Hebrews. Those of us who are of the new covenant are going to look toward Jesus Christ, but we're also going to understand what the Bible teaches. There would be no purpose for the Bible to say that Jesus is going to take the, the kingdoms in the book of Revelation if he wasn't going to do so. There would be no purpose that the Bible taught that, they, that Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David if it was not going to come to pass. And the only way to know which throne it was is to look through the lessons of history and compare that to the Bible to figure out who the covenant people were and what happened to the king's daughters uh, over to 2,500 years ago. There's a lot on this subject to be covered, and I couldn't possibly cover everything on it today. But again, if you'd like more information, go to the uh, cogwriter.com website and read the article on uh, the Anglo-Israelites and uh, the, the Ten Lost Tribes. We also have other sermons on this. This is an important subject for end-time Christians to realize because of how it will tie into end-time prophecies. And I plan on covering those in other sermons. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.